This is FRM Part 1, Book 4, Valuation and Risk Management, and the chapter on Black Scholes, Merton Option Pricing Model. Now, not only am I going to show you how cool this Black Scholes Merton model is, I'm going to show you how easy it is. But first, we're going to have to dive into some of the assumptions underlying the model. And so that's what these first couple of learning objectives are going to ask us to do. Explain log normal properties, uh, compute some realized return and historical volatility, then explicitly state the assumptions of the model, and then compute the value of an option. We'll go ahead and talk a little bit about warrants and some implied volatilities. And then just like we did in the last chapter with the binomial model, we'll go ahead and uh, ask the question, well, let's suppose that we pay a dividend uh, at some time in the time period when we own that uh, when we own that option. All right, so let's go ahead and introduce this concept of a log normal distribution. Suppose we have this random variable x, and of course, back in your statistics class or your economics classes, those random variables, they, they could be almost anything. Um, we're going to focus in this chapter on, on stock prices, but let's suppose we have some random variable. And what, what if we like to assume in, in statistics in general, we would love to assume and we'd love to be able to prove that the distribution is normal because then it makes life easy for us because all we have to do is worry about the mean and standard deviation. We don't have to worry about skewness. We don't have to worry about uh, kurtosis. But sometimes in some cases, um, there are random variables that are not normally distributed. However, if you take the natural log of that random variable, then the distribution becomes, uh, becomes normal. All right, so notice what I have in that second block point. When the natural logarithm of a random variable is normally distributed, then the variable itself will have what's known as a log normal distribution. And of course, here are some pictures of it. Look on the right hand side there. There's the picture that's quite familiar of the normal distribution. And then the picture of a log normal distribution. And notice the big difference. The, uh, the zero is for the standardized random variable is going to be zero. That mean is zero. And then uh, oh, we have to move that all the way over to the vertical axis there. All right, so note the log normal distribution has a lower bound of zero. Log normal variables then cannot take on negative value. So that throws out stock returns and bond returns and any other kind of uh, asset returns, right? But, but it includes prices because, at least in theory, uh, a price is not going to be less, less than zero, right? All right, and also it has a long right tail. So notice what I have in the last, uh, the last arrow point. Normal distributions cannot be used to model stock prices because stock prices cannot fall below zero. Which then brings in the question, okay, what can we do instead? We can use the log normal distribution. Now, um, this Black Scholes Merton model is going to make the assumption that stock prices are log normally distributed. All right, and so there's the, uh, the, the description of that normal distribution. So the natural log of stock price is S sub T, so that's, uh, that's going to be the stock price, is normally distributed and has a mean there, right? All that stuff before the comma, that's going to be the mean, and that's the, that's the mean not of the stock price, but the natural log of the stock price, and then there's the variance. And of course, the variance has to be weighted by time. I've said this multiple times. We know that uh, standard deviation and variance move through time at the square root. Now, what we can do with this uh, with this type of um, of a model is, as good statisticians, we can come up with a confidence interval. So that's what the example I have here shows. Let's take just a quick example: stock price of 60. We have an expected return of 10%, and then volatility of 15%. So let's use that uh, log normal distribution. And let's go ahead and compute. And these are pretty easy calculations there. If you need to pause and confirm those, go ahead. Um, so the mean is 4.139. And let me, just, let me just make sure you do this in your calculator. If I get my calculator out and I put 60 in there, right, that's the current price. And then I do the, uh, 
the natural log. I can't see without my bifocals there. I get uh, 4.09 or something like that. So the natural log of, of 60 is 4.09. So what we're saying then is that the mean, the mean of the natural log given, given what, 10% expected return and 15% and standard deviation, we're going to have a mean natural log of 4.139. And then there's the variance at 0.011. We'll take the square root of that in the, in the next continued example. All right, so let's work our way down to do this confidence interval. Uh, what do we know? We can do a 95% confidence interval. So we know that uh, 95% of all values will fall within about about two standard deviations of the mean, right? If you look the number up on the table, it turns out to be 1.96. But let's go ahead and do a 99% confidence interval, and that's about two and a half. But if you look that number up on the table, you get uh, 2.58. And so all we're going to do is use, uh, use the results of what we did before and uh, do the plus and minus, and we're gonna say, what are we saying, what was that stock price? $60 with an expected return of 10% and volatility of 15%. That, look at the bottom there, we have a 99% chance that if we buy at 60 today, we will sell between 47.86 and uh, 82.24. So that gives us some sense, right? It gives us some sense of the riskiness of this particular share of stock, right? If that confidence interval were, let's say, 58 to 62 compared to 47 to 82, we would know that that we would know that that stock has uh, substantially less risk. And by the way, this gives us some, at least some kind of relevance and insight and understanding to what we did in the last chapter with the binomial model. Remember, we had the uptick and the downtick. And, uh, and those were functions of, you know, kind of the stuff that we're doing here now. But what the combination, the coupling of, of our study of option pricing, remember, we're in an option pricing discussion here, gives us a really good, a really better, a re really more comprehensive understanding of potential stock prices, right? I mean, after all, what are we trying to do? Buy low and sell high. And this gives us some sense of the possibilities. Uh, how about that learning objective that asks us to explain expected return? I mean, this is pretty simple stuff here. All we're doing is saying that the expected, the expected stock price at some time in the future is a function of the current stock price and then compounded, right? So we're going to use our little e to the x button on the calculator. And so let's just do a quick example if we're priced at 40 annual return of 15% six months. So we raise that to the uh, 0.15 times 0.5, right? Six months is a half a year. So if we buy at 40 today, we can reasonably expect to sell it at 43.11 in six months. Now what we can do then is we can look at some historical prices and then work our way back to a continuously compounded realized rate of return. So that's what we're doing here. So look in this example. We buy an asset at 50 and then it goes up a little bit, it goes up a little bit, and then after five years um, it goes up to uh, 87. And so all we need to do is take the ratio of 87 over 50, hit the LN button on our calculator, and then divide by five, right? We have to chop it. And so continuously compounded rate of return is 11.08%. Now we've talked a little bit about uh, implied volatility, estimating historical volatility. We talked about the importance of the standard deviation. And so what we can do is we can use that continuously compounded return formula there that we have um, that we just did, and then we can adjust that daily volatility to annual volatility by multiplying by the square root of the number of trading days in a year. And of course, this is just a little bit more of a subtle formula in which uh, volatility moves through time at the square root. If you go back and look at the source reading, there's a really great introduction on the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model using using all the mathematics that we've just spent uh, the last few slides discussing. Uh, what the source reading does is that it jumps right into the deep end 
of the Black Scholes Merton model. What I would like to do is I would like to take you all the way back to the waiting in end and I would like to trickle in before we get to the deep end. So to do that, I want to give you a, a quick example of a simple option pricing model. Now this is not in the source reading and this is not part of the learning objectives, but I promise you when we get through this and then we look at the Black Scholes Merton model, you're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you went through that simple option pricing model as an introduction to the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model. Now the best way to explain this simple option pricing model is through an example. So let, let's suppose that we have developed a model that tells us that call prices are a function of four variables. The current stock price, the exercise price, the time to expiration, and some interest rate. We'll worry about that interest rate and what that really is in a future slide. All right, so here's the example. Six months call option, strike price of 90, written on a share of stock with a current price of 100, relevant interest rate is 10%. So we have the right, but not the obligation to buy at 90 when the stock is trading at $100 per share. So this is clearly an in the money option. The question then becomes, how much would we be willing to pay today for this particular option? Now we did all this in the last chapter with the binomial model, and so go ahead and remind yourself of how we use the uptick and the downtick and some risk neutral probabilities to come up with a price. We're not going to do any of that stuff here in this simple option pricing model. This is truly going to be a simple model. So I want to take two time periods. Let's go ahead and get in our time travel vehicle and let's skip ahead to the expiration date. That's what I have in my first underline point at expiration. So we're on the expiration date of this option. And let's just suppose that the stock price at expiration is $100. All right, so we have the right but not the obligation to buy at 90 when the stock is trading on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange at $100. So this option is in the money and it will be exercised. And so the value, the value of the call option is going to be, and there's my first simple option pricing model formula, S sub E, the stock price at expiration, minus the strike price. So clearly it's 100 minus 90 equals 10. Nothing fancy about the mathematics. So I bet everybody can agree that this option at expiration has $10 worth of intrinsic value. Since it's expiring, it has no time value, right? Nothing fancy about that. And remember what we talked about in the previous, in the previous chapter, that essentially what's going to happen, if I wrote this option to you, you come to me on the expiration date, I'm going to reach into my pocket and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you $10, right? And then our contract has been settled. But let's take a breath now and go back to today. Before expiration, this is a six month until this call option expires. We know the call price, the stock price is 100. So the value of that option has to be greater than $10, right? It has $10 of intrinsic value and it has to have some time value. So the question then becomes, how do we compute the value of that call option? In other words, how can we adjust that model to get to a number that's greater than $10? Now to do this, let's just go back to what we learned in our very early undergraduate days. What do I teach my undergraduate students every day in every class that I ever teach them? That the price of any financial security is the present value of the promised cash flows. Now with an option, what you're promised by the writer of the option is not really the present value of the cash flows, but the present value of the difference between the stock price and the exercise price or the strike price. All right, so look at the value of the call. Here's our simple option pricing model formula. It's gonna be S sub zero, stock price today, minus the present value of the strike price. So I have the strike price times our little E raised to the X button, and we're gonna raise that to the R, which is the relevant interest rate times time. So we can get this model here and we can do our input. So 100 minus the present value of 90 gives us $14.39. So in this simple option pricing model, the value of the call is a function of those four variables. So today, if I write this six month option for you, I'm gonna charge you $10 for intrinsic value. I'm gonna charge you $4.39 for time value. You're going to pay me, you're going to pay me $14.39 today. 
Now, of course, you don't break even unless the stock price goes up to $104.39. But the important part here of this simple option pricing model is that it's, it's simple. What it does is it gives us a reasonable estimate of the value of the call option based on those four variables. Now, this is not very realistic, and hopefully you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, Jim, we've been talking about risk management, we've been talking about standard deviation and volatility, this doesn't consider volatility. And so I always tell my students that I want you to think of the volatility as the fifth variable. And this is what Black Scholes Mert did. They took this simple option pricing model and they added volatility to get their Nobel Prize winning call price model. So here's kind of a summary of what the source material then tells us. All right, what the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model is used to price European option and is undoubtedly, boy, this is so cool, undoubtedly the single most important tool for the analysis of derivatives because, and this is what we'll see in future chapters, is that you can use this model and you can apply it to lots and lots of other stuff. And there are pictures of Fisher Black and Myron Scholes and Robert Merton. Of course, two of them won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, uh, but um, the Institute then, of course, they noted that had Fisher Black still been alive, um, that, that he would have participated in that. <clears throat> now, one of the cool things about this is that you think about call options and you think these are highly risky securities. <clears throat> And of course they are, but Black and Scholes and Merton were the first individuals to realize that you can take an option and you can take some kind of an underlying asset and you can form a risk-free portfolio so that the relevant interest rate has to be uh, the risk-free rate of interest. And there are lots of reasons that this holds true. We'll talk about these as uh, that this slide deck goes forward and, and, other, and other chapters in, uh, in this series of chapters. But here's, here's the cool thing among all the cool things, here's the cool thing about uh, this BSM model, that it is, it is the simple option pricing model plus the volatility. And so note that uh, when you come to me to write this option, we, we know the stock price, we know the exercise or the strike price, we know the expiration date, and we, we know the risk-free rate of interest. What we don't know, we don't know is what that volatility is. And so this is the big search. It's the holy grail is to find out what is the most appropriate measure of standard deviation. Hey, boy, didn't we do all that stuff, you know, with the risk metrics a couple chapters ago and, and the Garch model? So really, this is the holy grail. And so notice my last block point down there. The option price is purely a function of the volatility of the stock price. As volatility increases, so does the call price or the option premium. All right, quickly here, let's go ahead and attack the learning objective regarding the assumption. So there's no arbitrage, right? So uh, there are no possibilities that you can have no investment and take no risk and earn a positive uh, expected return. Price follows a log normal distribution. So we've talked about that before. Uh, the continuously risk-free rate of interest is constant and known with certainty. <clears throat> Uh, here's another assumption. This is one that this is one that we don't really we don't really want to wrap our arms around. The volatility of the underlying asset is constant and known. I mean, we have to put, have an input for this model, and so when we make that input, we just assume that it's constant and that it's known and that everybody else knows it. Uh, the underlying asset has no cash flows, but you can adjust for cash flows like dividends and interest payments. And of course, like lots of the, uh, the fathers of uh, modern portfolio theory, uh, the original model includes an assumption in which uh, there are none of those things out there, right? You don't have to pay taxes. You don't have to pay transaction costs. You can short sell any kind of an asset and so on. Markets are frictionless. All right, here's the notation there. We did a bunch of those back in the simple option pricing model. Uh, we're going to add a couple of things there. Notice at the bottom, there's an N parentheses, D1 and D2, close parentheses. These are going to stand for cumulative standard normal distribution functions. And I'll explain that here in just a second. 
All right, here's the, uh, here's the beauty of the Black Scholes Merton model. Now, the model can be kind of changed to compute the value of a put option. That's what I have there over on the top right. But clearly, the focus in textbooks and in all kinds of presentations is on the call price. But I don't want you to get the sense that you can only use Black Scholes Merton to price a call. You can also do it to price a put. But I want you to look at that formula over there. Uh, we have the stock price today minus the present value of the exercise price. Oh my gosh, doesn't that look exactly like, doesn't that look exactly like what I just had a few slides ago for the simple option pricing model? So note, the black scholes merton model <clears throat> is the simple option pricing model adjusted for that fifth variable. And that's why I put the ND1 and the ND2 in, uh, in, in red just to illustrate the difference between what we did before and the contributions of BSM. Now, that ND1 and that NT2, ND2, those, of course, are probabilities. And so I want you to think about this black scholes merton option pricing model as a probability-weighted, simple option pricing model. I mean, we're going to go back. Let me just go back here real quickly. We're going to go back. Uh, what do I have in the bottom there? We're going to take Instead of just 100 minus the present value of 90, we're going to take 100 times a probability, and then we're going to take the present value of the 90 times a probability to get to the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model price, right? Now, of course, we're not just going to throw a probability in there like, oh, 72% and 59%. What we're going to do is compute those probabilities assuming assuming that we can use uh, those normal distribution tables. So the first thing that we need to do before we compute the probability is we need to compute the statistic. And so I want you to skip all the way down to the bottom where I have uh, the words recall that <clears throat> the Z statistic is defined as X minus mu divided by the standard deviation. All right, you ready for just a, a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit of a statistics lecture here. Back when you were in stats class, were you in, in your stats classes, your professor always said something like, hey, you know that pond over there in the back of campus? Uh, there's no way that you can go out there and fish for an hour and catch any other number than six fish. So your professor says there are six catchable fish out there in the pond. And you say, no, wait a minute, I'm a great fisherman. I can go out there. So one day you go out and you catch seven. The next day you go out and you catch nine. And you do this fishing for a while. And the mean number of fish that you catch is, let's just say, seven. And you go back to your professor and you said, wait a minute, you told me that the mean was going to be six. And I'm telling you that I caught seven on average. And so the two of you have an argument, right? Is it six? Is it seven? Well, I mean, clearly, mathematically, six is not the same as seven. But from a statistical standpoint, six and seven, they might be the same number, right? So you look at each other and you say, all right, we can't solve this argument with simple mathematics. We need some statistics. So you get out your whole Z formula and you say X minus mu. You do the six minus seven, right? So you take the difference. So, so your stats professors were always interested in the difference between what they think something ought to be, like the return on a portfolio, and what the portfolio manager thinks it could be. And so that's why there's a minus sign there in, in that numerator. And then you standardize it by dividing by the standard deviation, right? So there's the, there's the Z statistic. And so clearly you should be saying to yourself, all right, Jim, what does this have to do with Black Scholes Merton? Well, these, these three guys knew that the letter Z was already taken. So, so they picked a different letter. They picked D. So there's a D1 and a D2. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at that D1, all right? It looks cumbersome. I used to make my undergraduate students memorize this formula for exams back in the way, way old days, but now, now I don't. All right, so I want you to look at that formula. What do we have in there? We have a bunch of variables. We have the stock price. We have the exercise price. We have the risk-free rate of interest. We have time. And we have a measure of volatility. There's that sigma squared. And we're going to divide it by standard deviation times the square root of time. Notice that instead of having a minus sign in the numerator, there's a plus sign in the numerator. 
And I'm gonna tell you about that plus sign here in just a second. So let's go ahead and look at an example. But first, what we need to do is compute D1, and then we need to compute D2. And my advice is to forget about that big old formula uh, at the first part of the D2 and just say that D2 is equal to D1 minus the denominator of D1. That's how I have my students do it. <clears throat> All right, let's go back and take a look at the example that we just did. Stock price of 100, exercise price of 90, time is six months, risk-free rate is 10%, but let's add the fifth variable, 25%. Go ahead and calculate the value of the call option. All right, so the first thing we need to do is compute D1. So there it is in the formula. So we'll take the natural log of the ratio of 100 divided by 90, and then we'll take the risk-free rate plus half of the variance, and then we'll weight it by time, and then we'll divide by a standard deviation weighted by time as well. If you do all that quickly, you get the 967. All right, but what I want you to do is I want you to look at the D1 equation I have right below it. So if you put this in your calculator, 100 divided by 90, and then take the natural log, what you're going to do is you're going to get the 1053. You ready for this? If you buy today at 90, which you have the right to do, and you sell today at 100, which you can do because the floor of the New York Stock Exchange is selling this share of stock at $100, what you're going to do is you're going to earn a continuously compounded return on intrinsic value of 10.53%. So that first part is the return on intrinsic value. Wow. So then we plus. What do we know? That call prices are a function, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, call prices have two components. It has intrinsic value and it has time value, right? So if that first part is the return on intrinsic value, the second part has to be the return on time value. So what are we doing? The return on time value, well, it has to be the risk-free rate, right? 10%. And then we're going to add the volatility in there. So we add half of the variance. And that half of the variance has everything to do with some calculus and taking first derivatives. Don't, re don't really worry about that derivation. And then we're going to multiply it by 50% because we're waiting it over six months. So if you do that, notice what you get. You get 0 0.0656. What is that thing? That is the return on time value. So that's why, here, let me go back here. Your stats professor was always interested in the difference. They were arguing about something. Here's the number of fish. Here's the number of fish you caught. Here's the stock return. Here's the portfolio managed return. Here's this, here's that. There was always a difference. So you always had to subtract. But with option pricing, you're not subtracting anything. You're adding time value and intrinsic value. So we take the 10% and we add the 6%. So that gives us a 16% return on time value and a return on intrinsic value. We divide by... Uh, we divide by volatility weighted by time, so that's 17%. So that gets us our 967. So D1 is 0 0.967. Then D2, let's just take the 967 divide and subtract the denominator of D1 to get us about 79, right? So D1 is uh, about 97, and D2 is about 79. Wow, that's really cool stuff. All right, so what we need to do is look those numbers up on the table, right? So if we run our finger down uh, 0.9 and run our finger over 0.07, what does that get us? 0.97. So there's there 83, uh, 834. And then for D2, we run our finger down 7 all the way over to 9, and we get uh, 78, whatever that number is. I can't read without my, <laughs> without my bifocals clearly. All right, so notice we have the simple option pricing model. Look, it's right there in black. It's the simple option pricing model, probability weighted. We're going to weight the 100 by the probability of 83.4%, and we're going to weight the present value of the exercise price by 78.52%. And that gets us a price of $16.17. Now, what did we get before? What did we get way back here? Let me go way the back. So in our simple option pricing model, we got $14.39. That price was computed ignoring standard deviation. But now we're going to use the Nobel Prize winning work of these three dudes 
And we're going to say, wait a minute, that simple option pricing model, it ignored volatility and it underestimated that price. So here, here is the Black Shoals Merton call price of $16.17. Now the intrinsic value of the option is still 10, right? But the time value of the option, which was $4 and whatever that was in the, in the simple model, is now $6.17. Right. So if I write this option for you today, you would love to pay me that $14 if I calculated the price using the simple model. But of course, I'm not going to be that uh, ignorant. I'm going to say, wait a minute, we need to use the BSM model. So I'm going to charge you $16.17 for this option. And so the beauty of this is that my gosh, it really is relatively simple if you compartmentalize all that stuff you learned about uh, normal distributions and the z-score back in your undergraduate stats days. All right, a couple of exam tips here. Um, if you're given the put value or the call value, you can use that put call parity formula that we did chapters and chapters ago. Uh, tip Two is that uh, if you want to take the n of a minus d1, it's just 1 minus the n of d1. And so what, what that really means is that that helps you uh, if on the exam you are given just half the table. If you're given the full table, like I give my students just the full table, but if you're only given half the table, then that tip two becomes important. Now, as the stock price becomes uh, pretty high, way higher than uh, the exercise price, then we call this a deep in the money option. Uh, what happens then, if you go back here, let me do this. Um, when you have a deep, deep in the money call option, that 83% and that 78%, they're going to bump up, they're going to bump up and they're going to approach one. So the Black Shoals Merton option pricing model uh, is really good at pricing at the money options, but it's not very good at pricing deep in the money options because it essentially becomes the simple option pricing model, right? If you put a one in there for eight, three, and you put a one in there for seven, eight, that is the simple option pricing model. And of course, just the opposite, uh, just the opposite for out of the money. All right, so quickly here about a dividend paying stock, what we need to do is realize that if we own the option and the stock pays a dividend, we, we, we don't get that dividend, right? If you own the option, you own the right, but not the obligation to buy or to own that share of stock. So if the, if the company pays a dividend, it's not like you're gonna stand there with your hand out saying, where's my dividend? You, you don't have the right to receive that dividend. So what we know is that dividends influence stock prices so we have to subtract the present value of those dividends from from the stock price and we did this last chapter in the black shoals merton option pricing model but what the source reading does here is it says something like let's suppose that there are multiple dividends paid in between the buying of the option and the expiration date and then you can use that formula there underneath the second block point where you're just taking the present value of each of those dividends, right? So if you just look at that, you, you have you have the stock price today, right, S sub zero, and you're gonna take out the present value of the dividend one and the present value of the dividend two. And under some crazy scenario, if, it's, if you pay dividends every week or something, you could just take out a, a bunch of those other dividends. Now, a couple interesting things about uh, about the dividend. So when, when the underlying stock pays a dividend, um, the only way that the option owner is going to receive that dividend is if they exercise the contract uh, before that uh, before that ex dividend date. And so sometimes, sometimes uh, if that dividend is high enough, then there might be an early exercise. But what happens is that um, um, the value, the time value has to be less than the value of the dividend for this to work. All right, so the option has to be in the money and then look at the second uh, circle point. This is what I was just saying. The time value of the option needs to be less than the value of the dividend. All right, so suitable conditions for the early exercise of the put options, deep in the money, high interest rates and low volatility. Um, now, there's this Fisher Black's approximation. So you can calculate the value of an American call option on a dividend paying stock 
And what it does is it sets the value of the American call option as the maximum of the two European prices. All right. And so, you know, in, in both cases, what we're going to do is we have, if we have a European call with the same maturity as the American call being valued, but the stock price has to be reduced by the present value of the dividend. But if this European option is maturing just before the ex-dividend date, then the time to maturity is trimmed down. It's trimmed down to something really, really low. Now let's switch over to, uh, let's switch over from secondary markets, right? This option was written between just, you know, just you and me. I'm Jim's financial institution and you're just some regular investor. But let's suppose that we have an, an option that is issued by a company. We, we call these warrants, all right? So a warrant, is issued by a company, it gives the owner the uh, right, but not the obligation to purchase shares at a specific price at, uh, at a future date. Now, the interesting thing here is that when the warrant is exercised, they have the potential to create some turbulence uh, in the market because these are shares that are going to be created. All right, so for these warrants that can detach from owning the shares, a lot of times companies will issue shares with a warrant attached to it. Uh, the value of these detachable warrants must be estimated as the difference. You ready for this? The difference between the market price with the, with the warrant and the market price um, without. And then the value of that warrant is going to be uh, multiplied by some dilution factor because uh, uh, the, there's going to be new outstanding shares that have to be issued to satisfy the exercise of those warrants. Now let's go ahead and finish up with this implied volatility. I've been saying this in this chapter, I've been saying it in previous chapters, is that this is kind of the holy grail. So the volatility is the only unobservable parameter in the BSM pricing uh, formula. What you can do is you can take those four, those four values, those four inputs, and you can observe the market price today. And what you can do, here, let me go back here. You can go back to, let me keep going, have patience with me. All right, so you can use those four variables across the top, right? And let's suppose that the, call price is the exact $16.17 that we computed, what you can do is use that on the left-hand side of the equation and then go back and solve for the variance up there. What do we have? 25%. You can solve for that. That's called implied volatility implied by the current market conditions. So it's really just a mathematical uh, a mathematical solution and what you can do is go to uh, there are tons and tons of web pages out there that will compute the black scholes merton call price for you but it will also if you input if you input the call the observed call price it will give you the implied uh, implied volatility so it represents expected volatility of a stock over the life of the option ah so what does that mean influenced by market expectations supply and demand and all that kind of stuff now look at the bottom circular point. There's no closed form uh, solution for this volatility. And so you just have to say, oh, oh, I bet it's around 25% like we had in that previous example when you go through and it'll do it for you. But those, like I said, those web pages will do this iteration for you. And that takes us through uh, Black-Scholes-Merton model.